that was um we can co-host this together but uh yeah yeah for sure but you can take it away you want yeah uh well first hi leslie it's been a long time it's great to see you again i know it's good to see you so this is uh so i guess like i'll start so um hello listeners uh welcome back to um our podcast uh we make the pod by talking uh my name is carlos cisneros i'm a phd student in linguistics and uh if if everyone can kind of introduce well today we'll be talking about um early intervention with a couple um with a couple of our guests who are um who uh, work in early intervention and um if I can have everyone else introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Takashi, and then our, our guests. All right, cool. So my name is Takashi. I am a high school teacher in Los Angeles, and I've been teaching for the past eight years. Uh, I've taught mathematics, science, and special education. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Leslie Manjarres. Um, I am a teacher of the deaf. Um, I teach in San Francisco. Um, I've taught through the district. I was five years um, in a classroom setting, teaching third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, and two years ago, I transitioned to do early intervention work with deaf and hard of hearing infants and their families. Hi, I'm Natalie Williams. I am, um, <laughs> I've, well, I've, I'm a teacher and have been for 19 years now. Um, uh, I have done pretty much it all. I've done uh, high school, elementary, and right now I'm in early intervention. Uh, so I'm excited to be here and talking about what I know about early intervention with you all. <laughs> great, great. It's, it's, it's great to meet you guys. Again, Leslie, it's, it's great to see you again. Uh, Leslie and I went to, well, Leslie and I and Takashi, uh, we all went to UC San Diego together. So it's, it's, it's sort of a reunion now as well um so the theme of this podcast as as uh as hopefully i've ex i've explained before uh but it's mainly uh centered around themes of education and uh so that early intervention is a topic that's sort of interesting to us because it it represents a different uh stage of education that we haven't really talked about before uh, a lot of the guests here uh, mainly our uh, high school educators. So, and uh, some of us don't really know a lot about early intervention or earlier stages of education or how people operate, how instructors operate at that level. So if, if uh, either of you could give us like a, a summary of what early intervention is. <laughs> yeah. Did you wanna, oh, okay, okay. Okay, well, so, I, I, I do think to clarify for audience, um, I do just want to let you all know that I have an ASL interpreter here. And so there will sometimes be a lag time as I'm answering your questions as she kind of watches for mm -hmm. my response. Uh, so this is Natalie speaking. Um, so to respond to your question, um, and Leslie, please feel free to jump in and add uh, as needed for sure. Early intervention really starts a Officially, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much history we want to get into, um, but you want to go back to maybe the 60s and 70s, um, sort of during that time frame. The goal had been to start uh, providing services to economically disadvantaged children, to children from 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 poor households. Um, that was kind of how the government viewed early intervention. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an effort to close an educational gap in teaching. Um, there was a recognition that teaching needed to start earlier. Um, and then we started to move into special education where special educators said, you know what, we also need early intervention uh, to provide for you know, family services for the families of students who really aren't receiving anything at all until they hit kindergarten at age five. So early intervention has focused on ages birth to three, that time frame where we can provide support um, to each each family service individually. Leslie, is there anything? Yeah. Yeah. So um, everything that Natalie had said was kind of focused on how the um, 
sort of there was the model that was set up and it had changed um, into f from the medical model specifically for special education. So special education um, early intervention used to be focused on um, sort of nurses who would go into the home to provide um, more medical intervention to special education students. Um, and then eventually that transitioned more into um, the home environment and how special educators could provide that into the home in terms of early intervention strategies to support the family through what Natalie had talked about was the um, family individual services through what's called an IFSP um, or the Individualized Family Service Plan. Um, so all of that actually falls under IDEA um, Part C, um, which is as Natalie had said, between the ages of birth through three, um, and that falls for each county across um, the United States. Oh. Interesting. So that's really that's really early. Yeah, birth to age three. That's that's interesting. Um, you mentioned I. I'm sorry. The I missed the the acronym I, IDF three. Is that? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on on what that is? The I IFSP or IDEA. Oh, both both of them. Yeah, I'm 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 sorry. I'm not very familiar with either of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there are definitely, as Natalie said, a lot of acronyms. <laughs> yeah. I think it might help to go through IDEA first, and I think that kind okay. of transitions us into IFSP. I'm gonna go ahead with IDEA, and then I'll do <laughs> IFSP. <laughs> oh, lovely. Go ahead. Um, so IDEA is um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, and so that is a federal uh, mandate um, that came, came out of a strong movement um, in the 70s, 80s, um, where um, a lot of different people kind of went uh, with the civil rights movement um, in order to gain rights for people with disabilities to have free and appropriate education. Um, because before that, uh, children who grew up with disabilities were institutionalized. So they were sent to asylums um, and that's where they were educated. And I mean, oh, wow. spoiler alert, they, they weren't educated. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And so what happened was IDEA mandated the federal government to have children um, be able to access public schooling um, and have that be the place in which they, they were able to access education. Um, so there's different parts. So there's part B and part C, which are the main mm -hmm. parts. Um, there's also transitional education for adults or mm -hmm. those kids who are 18 to age 22. Um, and part B is K through 12 education. Um, but part C, which is early intervention, what we're talking about now, is um, hmm. early intervention. So the part C is the one that focuses on the services birth through three. Right. And the document that mandates birth through three is the IFSP. Um, so it's the Individualized Family Service Plan. And under that plan are basically all of the legal requirements and mandates about how that service is happening, who's providing that service, what the, they're called outcomes instead of goals. Because um, Part B has goals, IEP goals, and that's a whole nother document that is a whole nother podcast, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, but uh, there's outcomes. Um, and then also additional services that can be provided, um, for example, connections to agency. So Natalie and I are both actually, because it's county based, um, we're technically government workers. Um, hmm. So we support um, families with um, all kinds of things. So it's not just like supporting the family with their educational goals. We also support the family with do you need support with housing? Do you need support with connections to medical providers? Um, do you need support accessing food pantries? Um, can I connect you to this agency um, to support you with mental health? Um, so we do that through uh, the IFSP. Oh, okay, cool. 
Um, so it sounds like to add. and Natalie. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, just to add, um, or I guess to clarify. So services up to age three, because that, that is our bailiwick, from age three through age 21 for those older children who have IEP documents, which as you said, is a whole other ball of wax and another, another podcast entirely. Um, just to clarify, early intervention can include all kinds of different needs. As you did mention, additionally, um, all kinds of disabilities, all kinds of different functions, um, vision, um, movement. Um, we certainly do include deaf and hard of hearing children. Um, mm. There are lots of different children covered under early intervention. Mm. Okay. By that point, mm -hmm. we both work, well, I specifically work with deaf and hard of hearing children um, as, as an IFSP supporter mm -hmm. or provider. Okay, I, I didn't know about that. That's that's very interesting. I I was curious. Um, uh, are there a lot of uh teachers do what you do, or like uh, educators that like um, or is there like a high need of um educators for the deaf and hard of hearing community? <laughs> yeah, there's always a high need, absolutely. Um, for qualified folks, it's interesting. Um, I actually my school. Um, is a is a special school run by the state. So mm -hmm. we partner with our local school districts and sort of our general statewide school districts uh, to provide these services. And so I work with a very localized school district. Uh, Leslie works with her school district. Uh, I've got a team, a pretty big team, in fact, of teachers that I work with. Leslie works with a team of smaller, sm a smaller team than mine, I guess about three folks. Yeah. So so we talk a lot about numbers, just like the numbers of our cases uh, and caseloads. Leslie's got a way bigger caseload than mm. we handle on our team. So, you know, and sometimes we kind of joke, you know, we say, well, there, there must be something in the water over in Leslie's district, right? Because sometimes you just get like a huge run of births of all kinds of children and families that are really going to have a lot of needs. And then sometimes you go through a very quiet period and you say, okay, what exactly, what sorts of services are we even providing during this time? So, but you're looking for folks who already understand the breadth of deaf and hard of hearing services really across the spectrum, right? Because it's not just a, a one narrow track. There are all kinds of, I guess you would say, um, you know, there's, there's the government part of our services mm -hmm. um, because as Leslie did mention, we do work with, and, and, you know, we really believe, with, with folks who really believe that there's only one tiny little thing that we do, but I think it's really important to specify that we work with all kinds of different services that deaf and hard of hearing children could need. There's all kinds of things that relate to their language acquisition needs. So I think that's really kind of the biggest issue facing us right now. And I, Leslie, is there anything you want to fill in there? No, I think, um, like Natalie was saying, it's um, kind of a bigger, a bigger need. Um, there are so few um, teachers of the deaf specifically. Um, so again, credentialing for teachers is a whole nother podcast also. Um, but uh, credentials for teachers of the deaf um, are sort of a really specialized credential um, because special education um, in California um, has specific credentials for different kinds of special education. And in order to get a teacher of the deaf credential, um, you have to go through really specialized training. Um, and then our credential um, goes birth through 22. Um, and so we're able to, you know, kind of as Natalie had mentioned, she herself has experience in high school and in other classrooms and in early intervention and you know for my my training and my program I also taught in high school um, during my internship um, I experienced middle school and then I was in an elementary school classroom for a long time you know before I moved into early intervention um, but those of us who are out there are so few because in California there's only three programs left I believe that are able to grant the credential the one at UC San Diego that I went through, um, CSUN, 
and then there is I think one still in Los Angeles somewhere, but it's an oral pro, but it's an oral program. There's a third one that's an oral program somewhere. Mm, um, mm. Cause they have shut, they've shut down all kinds of programs because to train us is also very expensive. <laughs> um, so there's a whole bunch of, there's a high need for specialists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's really unfortunate. Cause I know in general um, across the country, you know, there is a need for teachers, especially like in math and science and special education. Um, what you all are describing is just even more, you know, needed it, like t- educators and teachers. And if programs are getting cut or if credential like pathways are getting shut down, then, you know, it's going to be more of a challenge. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Um, is there like a d- dynamic of like race and class in terms of your students, um, like demographically, like like I, I don't really know much about it, but uh, I was just curious to know like what that looks like, like population of your students or demographics. Hmm. So where I live, we actually have a very high percentage of um, Asian and uh, Southeast Asian families. And so I would say that I, I've worked a lot. Um, I, I work with a lot of Mandarin speaking families in my district and certainly the impact is there. Um, our job is very heavy on us physically going into homes, into households. And so it becomes a matter of to receive the intervention the family needs to have a level of trust in the specialist. They need to know that we are not reporting their family status we're not, we're not bringing any of that information anywhere against the family. We act as a safe haven. We are there simply to provide a resource that will be supportive for their child. And that's really it. Uh, so that level of trust requires a lot of relationship building with the family, a lot of cultural understanding. Um, certainly I, as a white woman, need to be very aware of the privilege that I bring in and um, how, how I look, how I'm perceived. Um, so I work hard to be respectful and do everything that I can to provide a respectful level of support for families. Uh, yes, definitely um, issues of class, of socioeconomics, of various statuses impacting services certainly does matter. Um, there are families that don't have health insurance, for example. So we need to have a knowledge of what that system looks like Um, to say, oh, okay, all right, your child needs hearing aids or your child might need, let's use hearing aids as the primary example, right? So we'll just say, okay, so how are we going to access medical services? The family might say, we really, we don't have anything at all. Like there's just nothing, no resources available to us. And we say, okay, how are we going to approach that? Um, You know, an audiologist might tell a family, oh, you know, you need such and such, but we don't cover those things. Uh, so a family might earn literally $200 too many a month over the threshold to qualify for state support. So then what do we do? Uh, so all of that comes into play in terms of getting the family what the child needs. Um, and it can be a really, really frustrating field to work in sometimes in terms of having to navigate through this system which itself is so rife with systemic racism, which absolutely still exists. So how to, how to get through that, how to get families through that. Yeah. I mean, and to answer that question from a different perspective as well. um, So in my area in literally in the heart of San Francisco, right, we have sort of the Silicon Valley right under us. And we have also a lot of disparity in a lot of different socioeconomic class and and race and everything. Um, my caseload sort of as Natalie and I were sort of joking before. So I, right now I have a caseload of about 30 families, um, which is a lot um, for us and our team of three. And I'm the only teacher of the deaf who's serving those home-based families right now. Um, I have a partner who's a speech therapist and then my other partner's a physical therapist. So our, um, our shared perspectives are different and the way that we serve these families is different. Um, So our services aren't the same. Uh, So we're all serving these families together. Um, But we have, you know, 
the Mission, which is a historically Latino neighborhood. We have Bayview, which is a historically Black neighborhood. Um, we have, you know, the um, Chinese population, which is very high here in San Francisco. Um, and so I am constantly um, trying to support these families in their home and trying to honor them as well as, as Natalie said, and, and building that trust with them, right? I can have one home visit and because we're coming into the home and we're literally driving around town. So I can literally go into a home at 9 a.m. where I'm being served tea and I sit down on the floor and I'm, I'm you know, talking to their child through, <laughs> through a Cantonese interpreter. And I'm like trying to talk to them about like, how can we get this child some, you know, something other than medical intervention. Um, and then I will drive across town, you know, with a black family in the Bayview and going into sort of the, you know, family housing and being being like, okay, so I really need you to fill out this piece of paper with me. Swear, like, I, I am part of the system, but I will help you get through the system. Right. I just need your signature. Swear, I will help you. Um, you know, because we're trying to get them into these services and have and build that relationship of trust. Right. Like, I've had a lot of homes for example in in that in the, this particular neighborhood where i have to like walk around the building and like go into windows because they won't open the door for me especially those first times um and neighbors be like hi who are you and i'll be like hi i'm the teacher it's me i'm super you know i'm great i'm just here I'm not anybody like gonna do anything. Um, so it's it's being that and then building really right with my bags. With all of your tools. <laughs> yes, <laughs> with my toys. <laughs> um, and building that trust, you know, with families, and then becoming sort of that face in the neighborhood where, like, when I show up now, like people are like, "Hey, what's up?" and like, you know, tell me exactly where the family is and 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 what they're doing and what they're up to and like build building that safe place as natalie said um and then at this in the same day which which has happened to me before i'll drive across town to this gorgeous house that's like you know high socioeconomic class where like i'm greeted by the au pair and like i walk in to the playroom that's bigger than my own apartment um, and supporting that family. And, you know, so, so the disparities are, are definitely there. And yet at the same time, I have to also, in my own identity as a Latina woman, come into that space as well and present the knowledge that I have and support their child with, you know, their language acquisition and resources and how do we get them access and your child will be okay you know deaf people and people with hearing loss are fantastic people who will grow up and do wonderful things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely you know to, to piggyback on that yes we absolutely do have to identify systemic oppression and, and, and then at the same time i as a deaf person right going into a family home you know, they look at me and think, wow, what are you, what are you even doing here? You know, there might be all kinds of stereotypes working against deaf people in general within a particular family. And so definitely I have experienced working with an interpreter and then the family refused to look at me. You know, um, they've been exposed to the medical model and they don't understand why I never got that fixed, right? So, you know, at the same time, like, so I see the systems that families are going through, and I cannot take that personally as a deaf person. I just have to focus on meeting the child's needs. But definitely there's a, I mean, there's a lot of, of stigma there across the board. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when you refer to uh, exposure to the medical model, are you, are, you, are you referring to an attitude that the parents have developed towards um the conditions that their child has displayed such that they have to take it as a as sort of I, i'm not sure how to say it, a weakness or a disability and they have to find a cure for it is that is that what you're referring to yes somewhat yeah um that does come up absolutely there are you know we've, we've worked with some some cultural models right where 
uh, deafness is something to be fixed. Oh, it'll go away if you just treat it with the correct herbs or, oh, you know what? Some eardrops will take care of it. You know what? She'll grow out of it. And, um, you know, when you, when you look at the audiogram, when you, when you look at the information, the diagnosis, you say, you know, this, this isn't something that's going to change. Um, you know, you, you look at the identification of hearing loss and I have lost my train of thought, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. Leslie, you want to take it away? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think to speak more towards the medical model point is, and, and Natalie, you can jump in at any time, but one of the things that I've learned as a hearing person also is there's sort of the medical spectrum of hearing loss, and then there's the identity spectrum of hearing loss, and those intersect in different ways, right? So you can have profound loss, right? And based on medical interventions, where it be the, you know, hearing aid or the Ponto slash Baja or cochlear implants, which are a huge um, controversy within the deaf community, um, you can identify as a hearing person because of the way that you communicate. Or, or you can be a hard of hearing medical person, right, like where you only have a little bit of hearing loss medically um, and identify as a deaf person because of how you relate and how you your social um your social circle and your friends um and where you fit into the deaf community which is a large community um based on linguistics and where you go to school and your friends and and all of those pieces and there we come into the deaf identity right so whether you identify as hard of hearing or deaf with a little d or deaf with a big d um, and all of that sort of intersects and it changes over time. And for us in early intervention, we come up with parents who don't even know about the cultural identity piece because all they've been focused on because their child was just born is my child has been diagnosed on this medical spectrum. So how are we going to ad address this medical spectrum? And how are we going to fix it? Because I have never met a person on this cultural spectrum. So what does that even look like? You know, it's interesting. When you look at the statistics, roughly 90% of deaf and hard of hearing children are born into families who have no exposure, no experience to the deaf and hard of hearing experience issue theme, you know, so, so you take your baby, you know, you, you go to the hospital, you have your baby, and um, currently there's a requirement uh, to have a newborn hearing screening, they call it that. Uh, so the screening um, is an assessment that's done on the child's brain waves, in fact, in response to specific stimuli. Um, and they do that while the newborn is sleeping. Um, they've got actually like some little patches that are actually attached to the baby's scalp and they test for brain waves in response to certain sound, sound stimuli. And so they can say your child is deaf in this ear, but not this ear or profoundly deaf in both ears or whatever, whatever they find. So that is something that is done most of the time before that newborn ever leaves the hospital. And then, you know, maybe no referral is made or they make an appointment to come back later. So you have this baby who's born profoundly deaf and brought home and the family comes back for a follow-up one or two months later for follow-up testing. And they say, yep, we're confirming this. There is definitely a profound loss. So then at that point, they're referred um, the, and the, the hospital has a whole required paperwork uh, referral to do. They have to send that off to the Department of Education. So the Department of Education then distributes that to the local school district. So I might not actually receive that referral until an infant is maybe four or five or six months old. So during that four or five or six months time frame, all that in, all that time has been lost. So I'll say, and, and you know, again, it really speaks to a systemic issue. When you do, you know, when, when you when you're in the hospital and your hearing is your hearing screening is complete, 
I think everybody knows the danger of Dr. Google, right? Uh, you know, you, you sit down, you get on your search engine, and you find your new information about something you don't know anything about, and you go down a rabbit hole of all kinds of information that you've never seen before, and you really don't know the criteria to even search for. You have no idea. You're just bombarded with all this information. By the time we come on the scene, most of the time, parents have already talked to their pediatrician. They've already talked to all kinds of different practitioners. They've already talked to those practitioners about lots of kinds of options. A lot of doctors are not well-versed in this. I'll use my niece as an example. She's a nurse. And she has told me, oh, you know, she, she had like a one-time discussion of hearing loss once in her entire training. That was the sole total of her training during her entire medical education. So when you look at just, you know, doctors, early intervention specialists, the whole team, that doesn't come into play right away. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> I see. I see Leslie's head. <laughs> I see both of us are kind of making the like. I am processing his face. <laughs> um, yeah. So and 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 certainly both of both of you, uh, Carlos and Takashi. This is a new thing. Um, but all of this is profoundly affected then by by economic resources. When the system is complete and whole and fully supportive, we're able to do our job fully but we're not there yet. Um, we don't have a complete and supportive system in place yet. So as lots of educators in the United States and, and certainly abroad do too, we take a lot of expenses out of our own pockets. We do a lot of things on our own time. We do all kinds of relationship building just independently, just as individuals, just trying to get through everything we can to families trying to just make sure we come up with every single resource we can to be as supportive of the child as possible. Um, you know, and it's, it's really, really cool to have been in the field for a long time and encounter students 20 years later that you served at the beginning of your career who are now back to you with their own deaf children. So, I mean, it really is a very neat field to be in. There's a lot there. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I, I didn't know anything about this uh, before coming into this pod. I feel like I just learned so much. Um, and I just want to like, you know, appreciate both of you for just doing the work that you do. Because um, I know this is a you know community that's really in need. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, Leslie, I didn't even think about the whole identity and the medical, uh, you know, different models that people might uh, be struggling with. Um, that was something that never occurred to me or that I've never thought about. Um. I guess the next question I wanted to address is, because uh, I know there's been pandemic that's been going on, you know, for a couple of months now. I was just curious to know how has the the lockdown affected um, the teaching for both of you? That's what I was going to ask too. <laughs> um, oh. Natalie and I have actually had several conversations about this um, and our little network because so the way that it that it works, kind of like we talked about, since they're in all in different counties and there's so few of us, a lot of us are in connection with each other. Um, so, so the pandemic that's been happening with COVID-19 has been really um, an upheaval for us, I think. Um, it's, it's been really difficult. Um, I will speak for myself and my team where our physical therapist has been in the field for 30 years and I really had to push for our team to be like, we're going to have to start setting up, um, you know, video calls. Like this is going to have to be the thing that has to happen because we have to see our families. And one of the big things in early intervention um, is what's called the coaching model. So what you want to do is not necessarily do therapy with the child, even though that is a piece of what we do, right? Where we do, we come in and we teach the child a skill and we support the parent. A lot of it is I'm teaching the skill to your child, but we're coaching the parent and be like, okay, now you're going to do this for the rest of the week or for the rest of the two weeks. And really it's to have the, 
the parent learn how to do this for the rest of their lives, right? Because it's going to be an integral part of how they support their child moving forward. Um, and so a lot of people are like, this is great. It's forcing the parent to actually do the coaching model, right? Because you're not there for, for the parent to rely back on, right? Um, but the flip side to that is a lot of families and babies, a lot of their entire relationship with us and like Natalie had shared for her, you know, and I don't want to speak for her, but to, for parents to see someone who's deaf come into their home is very powerful, right? To see a professional come into your home as a Latina woman also is powerful powerful for a lot of families. Someone who signs is very powerful. So that piece has been missing a lot, you know, to have like babies come up and crawl, interact with us. This is how you do it because in the deaf community, a lot of things are very visual and very tactile. Um, and so not having that interaction face to face has been very difficult. Um, another piece also is babies are still being born. <laughs> babies are still being screened. Um, and so I've had five new families in these last two months where I've never been in their home and I've had to start services with them, right? Where I've, I've literally never sat down with their family on their floor and been like, tell me what you need. I've only been able to see them through the video. And so it's so different to have real conversations with family where sometimes you cry together, you know, and that's kind of a big piece of the relationship building um, because they're grieving, you know, it's really big for them. Um, and I think one of the other things is we talked about sort of the systemic racism and the systemic inequity as well, right? So the digital divide is huge for our families. And there's a lot of families who, you know, there's a lot of resources going out to high schoolers. High schoolers and middle schoolers can totally access Google Classroom. What are we doing about babies? Um, and then there's not a lot of technology things that are accessible for babies. And what are we doing to support them? And right now I have some parents who all that literally the only line that we have of communication is their smartphone. And on top of that layer is the layer of different languages, right? So I happen to be very fortunate that I speak Spanish, but I don't speak Cantonese or Mandarin or Tongan. <laughs> so all of those families, a lot of them just immediately like Google Translate has been coming in clutch because I can send a quick text message like I need you to download this app on your phone because if not, I wouldn't be able to get an interpreter on the Zoom to be able to talk them through new things. So upheaval. I don't know if Natalie wants to add anything, but I talked a lot. <laughs> no, no, I, I completely agree. And we're going through the same thing. The, the impact of COVID-19, I, I would say there's been a huge disconnect with families. Um, it requires so much more to get that, that, connection with families, that involvement with families. As a deaf person, uh, I, I do work with families um, who really run the gamut, people who do not sign at all with their children to people who are very excited to learn everything they can regarding signing with their children. But regardless, it's important that the child has access to language. You know, we always keep our focus on what we're doing for the child, regardless of, of where the family is on language learning. But for my families who do not sign, I do depend, I, I do use sign language. And so, you know, we, we will we'll gesture sometimes. And I do home visits without an interpreter. And, and we, we get by, we mind things. I do use my voice to speak sometimes. As a deaf person, I, I do use my voice. Um, um, and certainly that's, that's 
post years of speech therapy. But um, I, I, I talk when I'm comfortable talking, you know, and, and, and I, you know, we make sure that, that I'm doing that in comfortable settings because my voice doesn't sound like everybody else's. So I do that in moments when we are, we've already got a personal connection established and they looked at me and they look at me and they say, oh, okay, well, this, this deaf person is a normal person. Okay, that's fine. But now in our current scenario, we've really been caught flat footed. The, and there, there are there are lots of different interpreting companies. There are lots of different um, video relay systems that I can use to call a hearing person who who doesn't sign. Um, I call through a sign language interpreter. I, I do not get to see the person I'm calling. I do see the interpreter. Uh, there are very new apps coming out. Um, that one video relay company called Sorensen. Uh, Sorensen has got an app which is called Wave, Wavelow. Uh, so via that app, you actually do end up with three video connections on the, on the screen. So then I'm asking my families, could you please download the Wavelow app? And so far, all of my families have gotten on board and been happy to do that. Once again, that's because of the relationships I've already built with them, right? So then I'm able to see the interpreter, I'm able to see myself, and I'm able to see my family. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, and, and you know, it plays in, right, to, to the COVID struggle, um, then you've got your tech, technological struggle. Uh, quite a lot of families just don't have the, the level of technical access, right? Some folks do. As Leslie has said, some folks have just a smartphone, right? So then you're sitting there with a smartphone, um, and it's very difficult to see the full picture. You know, you're very limited to, you know, what the family is able to do. So it can be, it can be really difficult. I don't know, Carlos, if you had other questions, but I, I think another question I, I, that came to my mind was that I know you all mentioned that you work with uh, immigrant families, like maybe like Mandarin, Cantonese, Tongan, Spanish speaking families. I, I'm curious to know, do those families or the kids have their own sign language? Because I understand that American sign language is only confined within the United States, right? And other countries have a different um, way of signing, but I just I was just curious to know about that. Sure, yeah, yeah, and <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you know, I, I so want to check in with Leslie to see who's going to respond. I don't want to jump in and interrupt you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, yeah. Um, it is true that every country has its own sign language. You are absolutely correct in saying uh, that American Sign Language is used here in the U.S. There are some influences of ASL um, in, in some smaller countries where, um, you know, the, the influence of colonialism certainly is alive linguistically there. Uh, you know, if you, if, like I've gone to England to visit friends um, and the sign language there is completely different. It's British Sign Language and that is a completely new language than ASL, completely different. And it, it certainly takes time to acquire it to understand what anybody is saying at all. Um, just like any other language learning process, right? You, um, you know, the best approach is full immersion to really acquire a language. Yeah, and I think I'll um, I'll speak to that point in what we focus on when we're teaching our children um, is American Sign Language. Um, I know even when I was in the classroom, um, parents would sometimes want me to to teach Spanish to their child who identified as you know Latino, um, and they would speak Spanish at home, um, but there wasn't. I mean, there wasn't like there was the way that the classrooms are set up. I'm not allowed to do that in special education. Um, just the way that the laws are and the ways that the IEPs are written, unless we write it in as a goal. And also just because of who I am and my personal qualifications doesn't mean that that will be carried through, for example. Um, so there's kind of that aspect of things. Um, but especially in San Francisco, I think with children who identify as not just, 
you know, living here and being in the United States, but who have a different identity, um, you know, such as immigrant or maybe their first generation. Um, something that I always talk about with parents is your child has the potential to, to be not just bilingual, which is this whole thing in, in the deaf education community, right? Because a big piece of deaf education is about being bilingual, right? Being English proficient and being ASL proficient. But your child who also identifies as with their home language, whether that be Spanish or French, we have French right now and we have German too. Um, your child could be quadlingual, right? If you really think about it, your child could learn English, sign language, uh, German sign language, and German. Like your child has the potential to, starting now, learn all of these languages. Um, and that's a gift, right? You're, you're looking for, or you're, you're, a lot of parents really focus on my child is lacking something, but the child themselves doesn't actually understand that they're lacking something. Like, you know, it's not hard for them to be deaf. They just are <laughs> deaf. We're the ones as hearing people who are always being like, you're limited in this way when really there's are no limits in this way. Um, so your child has the potential to learn all of these other languages. Um, one of the uh, big communities right now is the, the LSM community or the Lengua de Señas Mexicanas community uh, in California. So C5 or the... Um, Concilio de Manos, um, sorry, I never actually speak that name, <laughs> C5. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they are big, <laughs> I'm sure Natalie's laughing at me. Um, they, uh, they're really big in um, that dual identity, in being deaf and being Mexican. Um, and so they are really big in being the quadlingual, um, in learning Spanish, and English and learning ASL and um, Mexican sign language. Um, so especially people who live near the Mexican border, um, there are quadlingual interpreters, which are fantastic, <laughs> um, which is huge. Um, and so they, they do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I myself took a, took a certificate course a couple of years ago in LSM. Um, and it was really cool. And so I'm able to, to share that with parents too, that knowledge, not that I'm teaching LSM, but I share with them like, it exists, it is an avenue, your child can do these things um, and they can explore that for themselves. I have another question. I just wanted to, I just wasn't sure if Natalie has something else to say. <laughs> it's harder to tell now. Yeah, <laughs> I know, yeah. I know it's tough, sorry. <laughs> um, that, that's another thing about using an interpreter. Uh, you know, I, I, I do work so much off of visual feedback. You know, I, I really use my visual cues to see whose turn it is or, you know, do you look like you're ready to ask me a question? So um, now that we're cut off from each other visually, you're, you're experiencing a little piece of what I do every day. <laughs> yeah, so working with families to educate them and and just make sure that they know that language acquisition is so important for their child and that you know we want families to have high expectations for their children we want that to be part of of the world for them we want you know any stereotype that the family may have about any individual that is not quote unquote, perfect or whole, so to speak. You know, these are terms that we hear thrown around. You know, we, we teach families to do away with that stigma. Um, but it is a challenge because we do have families who, you know, say, oh, you know, we, we don't, we, you know, oh, we, we don't want our family members to know that we have, you know, that, that our child is deaf in one ear. We don't want anyone to know you know, and we're going, well, no, like, it's okay to be open about this. You want people to know who you are. 
you know, because with awareness comes the ability to work together, you know, and not, not hold anything as a stigma against the child. Um, and just in terms of language acquisition, it's so key, you know, working with high school students who did not have language access at home, I have seen students view school as the only place where they have somebody to ask them how they're doing, whether they're hungry, just to say, hey, we're about ready to get going. Uh, you know, what are you doing tomorrow in ASL? At home, it's a complete communication desert, you know? Uh, they might have some kind of made up home gestural system to get the very, very basics communicated. We do see, you know, and we, and we support families because we know that families love their children and we know that they're not necessarily equipped or knowledgeable with how to support their children's needs. Um, and Leslie had talked about, you know, international signs, the, the, the respective sign languages of other countries, uh, the kids co who come to my school with the School for the Deaf, which is really wonderful about providing experiences um, along the in parallel with what a public school would provide in terms of, you know, we provide international studies where students are able to take trips to other countries, uh, you know, they, they do international trips, you know, they, they fundraise all year, uh, they do, they perform, you know, they go through really intensive cultural and linguistic studies of a chosen country, you know, and that's both the spoken and the signed language of the country. They go, they end up doing a really immersive experience. They're meeting deaf locals in that country. So it's really a beautiful exposure to the diversity of signed language around the world. And that's something that we're able to provide as a community. We've got, all, we've got that international organization piece. I guess, and I mean, you know, there, there's so many just different networks out there, you know, organizations very specific to education, organizations specific to, and of course, now I'm blanking, but there are all kinds of different things. But there's, there's a be the beauty of the deaf community is that it's truly worldwide, and you can meet someone anywhere and find commonality. You know, and I, I feel like it's somewhat the same here. You know, you meet folks and you build that community, you build that relationship, um, much like Leslie and I did. We live, I don't know, 20, 25 miles apart. We we met at a national organization, didn't we, Leslie? Is that right? Didn't where did we where did we first meet? A conference, I think, somewhere. Right. Yeah, a conference. Right. So so we met elsewhere entirely. We didn't even meet here in California. So you know those connections, that exposure, the networking, the language development. It's all part and parcel, and it's all so important. And I, I do feel like this is a little bit of a discussion at this point. <laughs> okay, so so that kind of brings me a bit to my my next question, actually. The, um, you know, meeting meeting these communities. Also, uh, it reminded me how you you mentioned earlier that, um, uh, often you meet your former students or you meet your former clients, and you're able to see sort of the impact that your work has provided in the lives of uh, these people, you know, which is probably great. Uh, I'm wondering actually how you might evaluate, uh, you, you might evaluate the experiences of people who've gone through um, early intervention versus uh, deaf community members who haven't gone through early intervention, but perhaps still had some form of deaf education, such as going through, still going through elementary school, and and high school, um, so how would you how would you evaluate the impact that that um, early intervention has uh, compared to people to other deaf community members who who still have had some kind of education at that point? Um, so right now I'm actually um, doing a specialist certificate program through Gallaudet University. Um, and Gallaudet University, for um, for everyone listening, is um, the only deaf university in the world, um, and it's in Washington D.C. Um, and um, there's this huge history, and it's like, you know, it's deaf university, so it's literally just college and 
master's students and PhDs um, all living together and working together on a deaf campus in DC. Um, so through there, I'm doing an online certificate program um, specializing in deaf and hard of hearing infant early intervention. And so this program actually talks about a lot of that research that you're talking about um, and sort of the comparison on children who have had early intervention in general, because there's, right, there's our, our sort of small subset of deaf and hard of hearing intervention versus early intervention as a whole versus populations who have not had early intervention, right? And then there's also different research on deaf children who have had deaf models in their life as part of their early intervention, and then um, children who have not had deaf models as part of their early intervention. So there's also differences there. Um, there's also few, very few, studies about um, immigrant children who come in after the period of early intervention and after the period of language acquisition who come into um, schools, into our school system, um, who haven't really had exposure to a formal language and what that um, period of language acquisition and therefore academic um, achievement has been overall. Um, because earlier in early intervention as it stands in the United States um, exists only in a few other countries, mostly in Europe. Um, it doesn't exist in a lot of different places in, around the world. Um, so that's kind of how, what that looks like. But basically, as you would sort of logically expect, children who have early intervention as a whole do better than children who don't. Um, deaf children who have models during their early intervention who are deaf and their families um, feel more positively and do better long term with their educational outcomes than those who don't. Um, and in terms of children who have had no early intervention and come into the system, trail behind their peers for longer periods of time overall. And there's lots of studies, which we can probably send and cite later. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely concur. Everything you said was dead on. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the different factors of early of early intervention of deaf modeling, um, the differences are stark. Absolutely, they're they're really apparent. Um, I have, you know, I've, I've worked with a family that decided to keep their child home, decided to homeschool the child until that child was a bit older, um, probably kindergarten or first grade. And then they said, oh, wow, you know, they, they felt like they just couldn't do any more at home. And then at that point, you know, in that situation, I, as the educator, you know, we, because I, I do work with educators who work with children above the age of three, right? I, I do early intervention with children up to age three, but then I also work with educators who work with children older. So the teachers in that situation got this child for the first time at six or seven years old with essentially the linguistic function of maybe a two-year-old, like a one or two-year-old child. So you know, here we were, and that was a serious game of catch up to try to get that child back to grade level, back to their age peers, to where they should be, you know, had they had full access. So you see children without early intervention services and exposure to the language, they're genuinely at risk for just falling behind and staying behind for life. You know, so that's an internal game of catch up for that child. It breaks your heart. <laughs> we're all doing our best. I know we're reaching uh, past the one hour mark, uh, but I did have another question. And this is more like uh, pers like personal, um, just kind of want to throw it out there. I know teaching is a really tough job. And I just wanted to know, like, what what has gotten you guys into teaching? And I know it's a pretty big question, so you can just share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. So I'm the product of a public school system. 
meaning that I attended a non-signing program. As a child, I was in um, a, a signing immersion classroom for roughly two to three years. So I had deaf peers my age from, you know, maybe age six through seven and eight or so. And I met a deaf person who was not a member of my peer group and realized I had not known that there were other deaf people in the world outside my school. My teacher was one of my favorite teachers. She, you know, well, and I'll say she was both my favorite teacher and, you know, and, and, then, and then finding out that there were people like me those two things, sort of having that teacher and then meeting other people who were grown up but were like me, I think those two factors together really set me on the path to becoming the educator I am. So I've wanted to be a teacher really ever since that experience. I've always known from childhood. But, you know, that said, I, I come from a family and an extended family of, you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents who were educators as well. Um, so we're, we're kind of a family in the field. But I never thought, you know, oh, I'll, I'll go and teach hearing children in a public school. I, I always knew that deaf education was going to be my life. I, I always knew that I wanted to serve as that model for children. To be honest, because I lacked that model my own self. So, yeah, I, did, I didn't have someone to look up to who was like me. I want to be that person. Um, I, I, I don't think that I really had that model in my life on a regular basis until graduate school. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of my in a nutshell answer. Um, for me, it was a longer journey. Um, so there, it was kind of two separate journeys that kind of converged into one. Um, so I'll start with, um, I grew up in a very small town. It was a farming community uh, in Southern California. Um, and my father is a pediatrician there and he's one of the only pediatricians uh, in the area. Um, and so I grew up also a product of the public school system. My parents really believe in public education and both of them are, um, immigrants to the United States and so they were like public school all the way and in this small town um, you know there just there wasn't we were all there wasn't a lot of people <laughs> and we were all pretty close um, and so school was a primary um, socializing place and so I grew up alongside um, a lot of deaf children um, in the small community and so in elementary school um, I made my first deaf friends when I was in fourth grade you could go volunteer in the uh, special needs classrooms um, and so I went to go volunteer for the for one of the classrooms that was what I understand now as a professional um, to be the mod severe classrooms where there were nonverbal children um, and so that was really impactful for me because I was nine um, and you know they didn't really play or do anything with me but the classroom right next door was um deaf kids and you know they were just running around doing their thing uh <laughs> playing you know talking to each other with uh with sign language and i became friends with them and i was just like yeah they're just like me it's cool we're friends now because <laughs> that's what happens when you're nine <laughs> Um, and I didn't see my friends again until we were in high school because the way that my small town works is we had two middle schools and two high schools and they swapped. So my middle school had the blind program um, and the other middle school had the deaf program and then it swapped where my high school had the deaf program and the other high school had the blind program. So then I saw them again uh, when I was in high school and you know, it was like, hey, my friends are here. So they were in what's called the mainstream program, kind of what Natalie was describing. Um, so I had interpreters in my classes and I had my friends in my classes and then I would uh, ditch class to go uh, hang out in the resource room uh, with my deaf friends and I hang out with them. Uh, and then sort of the parallel journey to that is um, 
I was slash am really into science. So I always wanted to be a field research biologist. Growing up, um, I was really into insects and uh, bugs and all of those things, still am. And uh, in fact, I will, here are my little, Natalie can't see these, but I will show them to her later. So I have my little bugs that I model with. <laughs> um, really into insects and bugs. Um, so I went to UCSD to become a field research biologist. And that was my major. And so I was there studying to be, um, you know, a biologist. So I was doing those things. I was a ecology, behavior, and evolution major and doing those classes. And at the same time, I was also, as Takashi and Carlos know, part of a lot of activist groups and a lot of different things and all of those spaces as well. Um, and as part of one of those groups was the Students with Disabilities Coalition. And so I was highly active in that group. And the leader of that group was deaf at the time. And talking with him, you know, he was one of my friends and he was in the community and everything. Um, I was like, you know, I kind of need a summer job. Like, you know, I have this other job that was tutoring lined up for the summer through a summer program um, called Bridge um, for tutoring. But I kind of need a summer job for like the beginning part. Like, do you know anything? So he um, he's like, yeah, you know, you know, sign language, part of the deaf community. You should really do camp. Camp's great. I was like, OK, yeah, let me apply for this camp. Um, so I started working for uh, Lions Wilderness Camp for Deaf Children. And I have for the last 10 years uh, since then. And at Lions Wilderness Camp for Deaf Children, I realized over the time when I was in college that it's teaching but outside. Uh, which was a surprise to me because what would happen is in the summers I would go work at camp and then I would go work for bridge and I'd be like, I'm doing the same things and it's super fun and I get to see, you know, growth and wonderful things. And then in my senior year um, at UCSD, when I was taking sort of the last of my biology classes, and then I also happened to be taking the highest level of sign language I could at UCSD because I realized that was kind of a thing that I still want to do. Um, my professor was like, you know, there's this grad program. Um, you should really consider it for deaf education. And I was like, okay, I guess. I don't really know. And then it kind of as the year progressed, I was like, you know, I don't really think I want to be in a lab with these people that I've been in classes with for the last four years. This is not where I see myself. So I went to grad school and got my credential and everything. And UCSD is, uh, and Natalie has a uh, roommate who, who, who went to the same program that I did. And so she, she also understands this. Um, but UCSD's program is one of the most intense in the country. It's one of two that's structured in the same way, but it's com like our credential is birth through 22. The experience you get at UCSD is birth through 22. Um, I interned at a high school. I went to a middle school, did student teaching. We had seven placements in a gen ed setting for placements. You usually get one placement in student teaching. I had seven placements over the course of two and a half years. Um, and I would spend months there. Um, and sometimes they would place us at two places where I would go one place in the morning and I would tutor in the afternoons. Um, so I was completely and fully immersed. Um, so that's my journey. And then I knew that because of my identity and because of all my activism work and everything, I wanted to serve somewhere where the, the student population, you know, was not deaf white and so that landed me here in san francisco yeah thank you all for sharing that it's really inspiring to hear your journey and the work you do with 
deaf community and just the you know with the children in general carlos i don't know if you had any other questions uh, that that'll that'll probably be it yeah so yeah. we can and then um i guess the last thing is uh do you all have any uh final thoughts or words for for the listeners or the viewers um that are listening to this or watching this oh make the book shout out um so there's this book um that i got for my class it is called early intervention for deaf and hard of hearing infants toddlers and their families and it's interdisciplinary uh perspectives um it's edited by marilyn sass lear um and it has evidence and applications uh, and it's the professional um perspectives on deafness um so it's a really good read and it gives a lot of the history and research-based practices and all of those pieces. So, Natalie, do you have anything you wanna add? I just wanna thank you all for giving us the space to share our experiences. And, you know, my, my initial thought of doing like a podcast was like, okay, how are we gonna have a deaf person doing a podcast? Okay. <laughs> but um, this has been a great experience and I'm always happy uh, to, to, yeah, to represent my work and the families that I work with and the, the, the team that I've built and the relationships that we've made, um, you know, and with Leslie, for example, uh, you know, to, to share these kinds of experiences. So uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, so often um, folks just sort of, you know, assumptions were made. And as we all know, assumptions can be really dangerous. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys reaching out. It's, it's amazing. And I'm glad we get to do this. It's powerful. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. you. Thank you too for everything. Thank you so much for presenting and just showcasing um, everything that's going on. Yeah, this was, this was pretty excellent. Thanks. This was good. And especially because it's, it's, it's a topic that's pretty, pretty much under pretty far beneath the radar. Uh, I like you guys had deduced to, I don't, I don't know much about early intervention. So this was really interesting. To, to learn about as a as a service you know as a public service that's that's available for for you know even even for me maybe like what if I have a kid who would benefit from this later right it's really good to mm -hmm. know about stuff like that yeah so that's that's really cool thank you again for coming on and, and teaching us about all this uh, I did have one last thing just to add um, I, I did want to thank our interpreter who came in here today for us Tanisa Yes, thank you too. Yeah, that's, thank that's you. Great. Yeah, you did a great job. Yeah. All right. Um, that's all I got. But uh, thank you all so much for uh, joining us on this pod. And yeah, if you ever, if y'all ever want to join us again in the future, please let me know. If you all want to jump in about on different topics, because uh, I know we have, we've done like variety of different topics uh, relating to like race and culture, and education. Yeah, it sounds like you guys could also speak to many other things like previously you mentioned like like the credentialing issue like and how that could be a whole other thing. Yeah, I could I could see that coming up again. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So Say thank hi to you. Facundo for me. I haven't seen him in years. <laughs> I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will for sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. See you guys soon. Thank Bye, you. guys. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye.